So, in 1853, there was a young excavator and historian called Hormuzd Rassam, who was sent to what is now modern-day Iraq to try and find more Assyrian artefacts. Um, a load had been found a couple of years earlier, and uh, the British Museum wanted to find some more, so they sent uh, Hassam, who was very sort of eager for the job, um, to find some more. And he uncovered, uh, in 1853, he uncovered the lost library of King Ashurbanipal, who was king of the Assyrian Empire uh, in around about the mid 600s BCE. And this library, lost library, had many, many hundreds and indeed thousands of broken tablets uh, with writing on it, with cuneiform writing on it. So they sent all these tablets back to uh, England, and about 20 years later, there was another man called George Smith Hello. who had translated some of these tablets, and he had uncovered an ancient epic poem. And within this poem, there was the story of a man who had escaped a massive flood which wiped out humankind. He had escaped it by building a boat and putting in a load of animals in this boat. And after seven days, uh, the boat runs aground on top of a mountain and he sends out various different birds, including a dove, uh, to see if there's any more land. You get it? So George Smith uh, translated this and he published this um, in what he calls the Chaldean account of Genesis. And it immediately caused a massive sensation, made him instantly famous, because of course this was a direct uh, similarity to Noah's Ark in Genesis. And there was a lot of hype about it. The only problem was is that the tablets that George had been working on um, were all broken and there were lots of lines that were missing, there were lots of chunks that were missing, and part of what was missing was part of this flood story, um, namely the opening of it. The British Museum was not very keen to spend the money to send another expedition, but the Daily Telegraph was. And so they gave uh, George Smith a load of money to find this missing piece, as if it was as easy as that. Well, turns out it kind of was as easy as that, because uh, he very quickly found, found it, or at least he found an opening of a flood story that could be related to it. So he didn't find the exact piece, but he found something that was similar. He enjoyed this so much, he went a third time. However, this third trip would prove fatal, because uh, George Smith, he uh, died on the way back of dysentery. So there we go. So yeah, so this um, epic poem we now call the Epic of Gilgamesh. And since then, more more and more uh, pieces have been found, um, and turns out this epic was a major, major uh, thing of its day. It was um, something. It was a story that was told orally a lot, um, and it was written down quite a lot as well. Um, the tablets that were found in King Ashurbanipal's library. Uh, this is now what's known as the standard version. This was written by. And this is what so. What I find interesting as well, because the tablets that were in King Ashabal, Ashurbanipal's library um, were, even at the time, hundreds and hundreds of years old. So they think the scribe that wrote these tablets lived, they don't, they don't know specifically, but they think he lived around about 1300 to 1000 BCE. Um, and so these tablets had been sort of kept for hundreds, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years until they were collected by King Ashurbanipal. In his library. Uh, after his death, the palace and that library was uh, very soon destroyed, um, and yeah, it wasn't uncovered for another 2,000 years until uh, Rassam uncovered it. So I have been very interested in this um, recently. I have recently read uh, this, which is the Andrew George uh, translation. Um, I'm interested because, I've said this countless times, but I am interested in the through line of literature. I'm interested in where literature comes from, why certain things influence other things. And this is kind of like the the bedrock. This is like the in terms of foundational text, this is the this is the foundational text. Um it's one of the first kind of major epic poems that we have now. Um and yeah, and it inspired uh things down the line. Now the so as I say, that kind of standard version, that's around uh so 3,000 years old, um, there are other sort of fragments and things that were found, including some Sumerian poems, um, not of Gilgamesh, but of Bilgamesh, uh, and these 
are about 4,000 years old. These sort of date around 2000 BCE, so it's kind of like, so it's been around a lot. So yeah, so I've read this, and I also read uh, this really, really good book, uh, The Buried Book. Uh, this is by David Damrosch. And this kind of goes into the history of, um, you yeah, know, about Rassam and George Smith and, you know, the kind of the, their exploits and the difficulty it was in translating it and, and all the sort of stuff. And uh, about King Ashurbanipal and, and stuff, so it's fascinating. So I'm really, really interested in this stuff. So what is the Epic of Gilgamesh? Gil what is the Epic of Gilgamesh? Well, let's go through it, shall we? Uh, so Gilgamesh, they think, was a real person. This is sort of a historical guy. They think he was a real person who lived more or less five five thousand years ago, uh, and over time he sort of became a sort of legendary figure, a mythological figure, uh, which is detailed in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So at the beginning of the epic, Gilgamesh is the king of the city of Uruk, and he is half mortal, half god, so similar to kind of Achilles. And uh, the poem goes into great pains to tell us how hunky he is and how beautiful he is and how strong he is. He's very, very tall. He's very, very muscular. And uh, yes, he's he's very, very, uh, he's a bit dishy. However, he is also a tyrant. He's a really nasty king. He's an autocrat and he's a despot. He's a tyrant. He particularly has a habit of forcing uh, newlywed brides um, to sleep with him before they sleep with the bridegroom. And the people of Uruk are fed up with this, and they call to the gods and say, can you please do something about Gilgamesh? He's a nightmare. And the gods say, yeah, okay. And the way they do it is a bit interesting. So they create a wild man in the wilderness um, who is kind of Gilgamesh's physical equal, um, except he's brought up by the animals. He's covered in hair, and he's kind of like a wild... Arr. And this wild man is called Enkidu. Uh, and the locals are a bit scared of Enkidu, and so they send Shamhat, who is a prostitute, they send her to tame him, which she is very successful at doing. She, uh, she basically sleeps with him for six days. They have sex for six days, and afterwards, the animals, uh, they want nothing to do with him. They're like, oh, I don't want anything to do with you, so they abandon him. Um, and Enkidu, he's a bit kind of like, oh, what do I do now? And so Shamhat basically... Um, takes him to a local shepherd. And it's there, they kind of do a sort of a bit of a My Fair Lady on him. They teach him how to eat and drink properly and clothe him and stuff. And shortly after that, someone comes rushing in and says, Gilgamesh is about to do this nasty thing in the city of Uruk again. And so Enkidu is like, right, I'm going to go and I'm going to face him and they're going to fight him and stop, make him stop doing it. Uh, on the way uh, to Uruk, Gilgamesh has some prophetic dreams um, about Enkidu um, and about his arrival. Um, and these dreams are homoerotic, to say the least, um, and he doesn't really understand them, and he asks his, his mother um, what they mean, and she basically says, and she basically says, this man's going to come along, and uh, you're going to love him the way you would a wife. And apparently the text uses the same language that um, it uses when talking about Shamhat and Enkidu um, getting off with each other. So take that as you will. I wouldn't get the pride flags out just yet, but um, take that as you will. So uh, Enkidu arrives at Uruk uh, just when Gilgamesh is about to take this bride, and he goes, hang on a minute, and they fight in the middle of the street. And it's a big fight, and the doors shake and everything, and blah, blah, blah. And I think Gilgamesh kind of wins, sort of. Um, but because... Enkidu's, he's, he's so impressed by Enkidu, and, you know, they are basically the same strength of each other. Uh, Gilgamesh says, uh, I will be your lifelong friend, and um, he stops being a tyrant. So there we go. Uh, and they do become very good, good friends. Um, and they have a few adventures together. So the first one, they, they go and kill an ogre called Humbaba, who oversees a cedar forest. They, they want to cut down the forest for wood and stuff, so they go and they eventually kill Humbaba. Uh, when they return, there's a love goddess called Ishtar, and she gets a bit of the hots for Gilgamesh, and uh, she basically propositions him. She's like, ooh, uh, but Gilgamesh is having none of it, and he's like, I don't think so. Look at all these men that you've um, had before, and you've basically ruined their lives. I'm not going with you. You're a, you're a boot that bites the foot. And Ishtar is 
absolutely outraged at this. She's, uh, you know, very, very affronted. And she basically goes to the King of the Gods and she says, I want the sacred bull. I want to kill Gilgamesh. Um, and it takes a, bit, a little bit of time to persuade him, but then he says, all right, have the sacred bull and that's fine. And so she sends the sacred bull after him. And this is a big kind of nasty thing. Whenever it snorts, um, it kills a hundred men like that. Um, that kind of thing. But uh, Gilgamesh, with the help of Enkidu, they slaughter the sacred bull. Um, and unfortunately, this upsets the gods, but uh, also Enkidu kind of takes things a little bit too far because he takes a piece off the sacred bull and he throws it at Ishtar and he says, that's what I think of you! Um, and this kind of really, really affronts the gods. And so they say, right, one of them must die. And so Enkidu, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, dies of a long illness, um, which for him is kind of a, um, is a, is shameful because he wants to, you know, die as a warrior and stuff. But he dies um, from this illness. And he gets visions of the underworld, it's all these horrible, terrifying visions of the underworld. And much like the film Event Horizon, um, the hell scene in Event Horizon, uh, this has been lost. Um, we don't, there's apparently like 40 lines which describe horrifying things of hell or the underworld, and that's been lost. Similar to Event Horizon, the hell scene from that. Uh, and eventually, uh, Enkidu does die. And Gilgamesh has this very intense, long period of mourning. He's absolutely devastated. Uh, very similar to Achilles and Patroclus. <laughs> um, and he, he refuses to bury him. Um, and what, in what is kind of a very kind of vivid, um, horrible image, but, you know, particularly, but it's very, very uh, striking. He refuses to bury him until the sixth day when a maggot crawls out of Enkidu's nose. And Gilgamesh is forced to face up to the fact that Enkidu has died. So Enkidu's death has a profound effect on Gilgamesh. And, uh, he decides that he doesn't want to die. He wants to become immortal. Um, so he goes on this long journey to find this guy called Uta Napishti, uh, who apparently is immortal and he survived this the Great Flood. And so he's like, oh, I'm going to find him and see what, how he's immortal and how I can be become immortal. Um, he goes to the edge of the world. Um, and of course, at the edge of the world, there is a pub and there's a landlady there. Um, this isn't in the standard version, but in one of the um, kind of other fragments, uh, this landlady gives Gilgamesh a very, very good piece of advice on on stuff about how trying to find immortality is like a fruitless endeavour and what really matters is um, staying clean. I'll read it to you, actually, because I think it's great. So she says, Oh, Gilgamesh, where are you wandering? The life that you seek you will never find. When the gods created mankind, death they dispensed to mankind. Life they kept for themselves. But you, Gilgamesh, let your belly be full. Enjoy yourself always by day and by night. Make merry each day. Dance and play day and night. Let your clothes be clean. Let your head be washed. May you bathe in water. Gaze on the child who holds your hand. Let your wife enjoy your repeated embrace. For such is the destiny of mortal men. You stay clean, be honest, and be funny. But Gilgamesh isn't having any of it. He um, he goes on a ferry with a boatman, and it, eventually he finds Uta Napishti, um, who is this man who um, survived the flood. And Uta Napishti, he kind of uh, does the same thing as this landlady. He kind of um, rebukes Gilgamesh a bit. Um, and he tells the story of how he became immortal. So yeah, humankind was getting too noisy for the gods, and so they decided to wipe them out um, with a flood. Uh, except for this guy, who uh, they told to build a boat and all the rest of it, and that's the basic, the basic Noah story. Um, and afterwards, um, as a kind of blessing, uh, they give him and his wife the gift of immortality. And it's like a one-off. And Uta Napishti, he does tell Gilgamesh it was a one-off. Um, but to kind of ram the point home that it's like a fruitless endeavour, he says, um, if you can try, try and stay awake for six days, and then, you know, we can talk about immortality. And, and Gilgamesh uh, says, all right then. But then he falls asleep immediately. He sits down, he, he sits down, he falls asleep immediately. Um, and he actually sleeps for six days. So that's, he fails at that. And then he's sent home, but before he goes home, Utanapishti kind of takes pity a little bit on him, and he says, look, I can't grant you immortality, but there is a flower. If you can get that flower, then that will grant you your youth again. It will make you young again. 
And Gilgamesh, for some reason, he's a little bit mistrusting of this, but he goes to the bottom of the ocean, he gets the flower, um, and he says, right, I'm not so sure about this. What I'll do is I'll go back to Uruk and I'll give a little bit to an old man, and if he gets young again, then I will take the rest of it. Um, on the way home, he goes into a lake to bathe, he leaves the plant on the side, and a snake, a snake comes along, takes the plant, um, and leaves, but before it leaves, it sheds its skin. And so Gilgamesh, poor Gilgamesh, he comes out of the lake, he sees that the plant is gone, he sees that the, the dead snake skin, he sees what happens, and he weeps bitterly. Um, and then at the end of the poem, he just goes back to Uruk, and he basically, and that's it, he goes back to Uruk. Um, the poem is bookended by um, references to the city walls, Uruk's city walls. Um, it basically says, let me read it to you, Climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth. Survey its foundations. Examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fixed in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundations? And I guess that's sort of saying that he is still the king of this great city and, and all the rest of it. Um, what is also interesting is that at the beginning, in the prologue, it says this. It says, See the tablet box of cedar. Release its clasp of bronze. Lift the lid of its secret. Pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli and read out the travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. Which is what Rassam did. He uncovered this great epic um, in the 1850s um, after 2,000 years, which I thought was interesting. So yeah, so it's it's an epic which had a clear influence on things like Genesis. Um, and also it had a clear influence on things like the Iliad. Now, I read an article which sort of um, attempted to do some similarities, and I was a bit sort of unconvinced with some of them. But certainly with Enkidu and Gilgamesh and Achilles and Patroclus, that kind of intense grief um, of, uh, of one, friend losing a one friend losing another, that's certainly striking. Um, and also, I mean... I think Andrew, it's, it's either him or, it's, I think it's in this book, I think he sort of um, uh, makes comparisons to David and John in the Bible as well. So as a foundational text, I do find it fascinating. There is a kind of paradox in the way that it's not a classic in the way that the Iliad is, and yet it is. <laughs> it's, and the, the way that the library of Ashurbanipal was destroyed actually kind of, in a weird way, um, saved this epic because these tablets are so fragile that if they were sort of exposed, you know, for 2,000 years, they would have probably just worn away. But them being buried for this amount of time has kind of sort of preserved them, even if, even though they are broken and stuff. And yes, and even though I'm sort of a little bit tenuous with the Iliad link, it does kind of make sense because as this was such a popular um, oral story that was told. It's not really unreasonable to think that this story, um, you know, travelled over, I think it's, it's only like a thousand miles to where Troy is, you know, so, um, or where Troy was. So uh, it, that makes sense. And yes, and I would really recommend uh, these two books. Um, this, as a translation, is fantastic. It might be a bit frustrating if you, if you want, like, the story of Gilgamesh um, just as a story, then it might be a bit frustrating because he only translates what is there and what is there is very fragmentary and so whatever is not there he doesn't translate. So if you can see there are sort of gaps, um, you know, which he doesn't attempt, he doesn't attempt to fill in. Um, but it gives the standard version, it gives, um, it gives translations of the many different fragments. And then this, I love this book a lot. This is, um, this is basically a, an account of of the epic itself, but also of um, Rassam and George Smith and and yeah, just like how how it was excavated, how it was translated. Uh, Rassam, his work ended up being sort of passed off as someone else's. You know, there was a sort of rivalry between people. Um, and then, of course, uh, George Smith's death is kind of really kind of like whoa. Um, and then it, go, it goes right back to what we know of Gilgamesh as a person kind of 5,000 years ago. So it's a very, very good book that I'd recommend if you're interested in this sort of stuff. And I'm very interested in this sort of stuff. And I am wanting to make a series. This might be the first part. Um, I don't know what 
to call it. I might call it Fire the Cannon! Because <laughs> I quite I think that's funny. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of very, very interested now in reading foundational texts, which I am currently doing. So I hope this has been interesting. I've, I find it interesting. Um, I would recommend those two books. And uh, yes, here's to the next one, whatever that may be. So yes, see you later. Bye bye.